it really is putting pressure on people. If you didn't drink, you were yeah. <laughs> alienated almost, right? They were so surprised that their beer has no alcohol. They actually taste so much better than some alcoholic beer. Hi, I'm Michelle. Welcome to the Upward Spiral Drink Less to Live More podcast. I'm really excited today to introduce you to Leo Groom, National Sales and Customer Experience Manager at Soba, an amazing Australian non-alcoholic beer brand. This brand is so special. I cannot wait for Leo to tell you more about it. Uh, but first up, Leo, hello. Hello, and... hello, Michelle. Lovely to be here, first of all. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And um, yeah, thanks for having, thanks for coming. I'm really excited. Sure. Uh, you are in town for the FHA... Food and Beverage yep, Expo. Expo, correct. Yeah, so uh, I'm in town for that. We, uh, we actually are here to, I guess, give some support to our distributor who is uh, based in Singapore, which is a free spirit... Uh, non-alcoholic company as well yeah. so you to give them some support but also to i guess uh bring the sober brand to life within southeast uh queen uh, southeast uh, asian region sorry yeah and this is the first time we've met and um i work with emma from free spirit a lot yes, and she's been on this podcast uh and when I have been helping them out um, on their stand this week at Pro Wine, which is also part of the expo. Right. And uh, she very excitedly told me that you and Soba were here in Singapore. So I jumped at the chance to hunt you down and uh, hope in the hope that you would come and talk to us today because uh, you just have, or the brand itself, Soba, has just such a wonderful story and wonderful mission. Awesome. Uh, so really, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. I'm going to jump straight into it because uh, one of the biggest questions that I get asked from my friends that drink yeah. uh, when I say, oh, do you want a non-alcoholic beer? The biggest question I get is, what's the point? It is a big question. And I think it's actually, yeah, it's sad that people ask that question, what's the point? It's more like should be asked why you should be doing it, to be honest. It shouldn't be what's the point, more like, yeah. Yeah, we sh like, why should we not drink alcohol rather? You know what I mean? So, um, you know, there's a lot of different reasons to not drink alcohol or, or uh, yeah, or I guess uh, stay sober or whatever you want to sort of call it for you. Uh, there's multiple people out there who uh, don't drink for whatever reason, whether it's uh, for medical reasons, whether they just don't want to drink alcohol, uh, whether they just trying to, I guess, go out with friends and socialize, be a social person without having alcohol, but still have something in their hand that's, I guess, represents uh, a beer or wine or spirit, or whatever it may be. Um, or I guess, yes, yeah, just people who, I guess, who are drivers or are driving around as well, who still love the taste of beer uh, and still want to get in their car. There's, there's multiple other reasons. Uh, pregnancy as well. Uh, you know, you can still, uh, yeah, have enjoy an alcohol a beverage. So. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of reasons and you'd be surprised how many people have a reason to drink non-alcoholic products for, for, for uh, yeah, for the taste of the product, yeah. I want to get into this kind of because you don't always need a reason yep. to, to, to not drink alcohol. I think, um, and this is one I did an interview with Joelle from Drop Bear Brewing yep. and they're also a craft beer um, company from the UK. And like them, your product is just, is so good. And um, they have people choosing their product, not because they even want a non-alcoholic alternative. They're choosing their product because it actually tastes great. It's a, it's a viable alternative to a beer, not just because it's non-alcoholic. I guess, yeah, very similar to us. Um, Sober has a lot of other reasons of why we, I guess, exist. Uh, in the taste department, uh, that's really, really important to us. Quality is of key. Uh, we, we, we don't want to produce a product that's um, inferior. It's very premium in terms of the, what we actually put in the beer, um, in the flavors uh, that we actually have that are native to Australia, uh, makes it unique in that space as well. So um, I guess from a, from a non-alcoholic beer perspective, uh, producing quality beer and liquid um, that has a lot of flavor is of key. And uh, we, we definitely don't want to, I guess, go down the path of, of trying to be 
uh, more of a mainstream player. We really want to um, provide a product uh, that everyone can enjoy, uh, that has great flavor um, and also has a story and uh, some real, I guess, people behind it who want to, um, I guess, give a good give a good or produce a good product out there that people can actually connect to. Let's tell our listeners the story of how Sober came about. Our founders, uh, Clinton and Lozen Schultz, they're behind the Sober brand. And Clinton himself is uh, the man who created the product. So um, he one day so decided to yeah just stop drinking. So he, he, he did drink alcohol in, in large amounts. So this is a story, I guess, he's uh, told me, drink alcohol in large amounts. Um, and then uh, one day decided, yeah, look, I'm, I'm not going to drink anymore um, for multiple reasons, of course. And um, he then went on a journey trying to find a non-alcoholic replacement because he really liked beer. Uh, he has a bit of history of brewing some beer with his, with his parents and his dad. So, yeah, he, uh, he went on a journey to find good alcohol, non-alcoholic beer. But, yeah, he was, yeah, he was dumbfounded was to find there was actually not much in the market uh, at all that's uh, of good quality. Um, so yeah, that's when he, I guess, went into Europe uh, to see what was out there because I think there was a bit more out there at that stage. This is back in about 20, 2016. So that's when he's made the decision, look, yeah, I think I need to bring something really quality, really premium with a story behind it to the market uh, that's set, that speaks to uh, the Australian people, uh, the uh, Indigenous people as well. And, and also just giving back to communities um, as well as, yeah, you're just bring, providing something that's actually with a, that has a good story to it. So in 2017 is really when it kicked off. So it started off in 2017 uh, and then he, uh, I guess, branched out really quickly because there was no other non-alcoholics in the market really. So uh, you could call it the first non-alcoholic beer in Australia, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. And you guys are now the biggest non-alcoholic brewery in Australia? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Not just the biggest. We're the first non-alcoholic brewery in Australia. Uh, so there's uh, no other, I guess, dedicated non-alcoholic brewery. Uh, there are a lot of brands uh, which uh, actually contract brew through other breweries, uh, which make a lot of different types of other beers, of course. Um, and we, we, uh, this was a big mission for Clinton and and Lozen as well. So they really wanted to be the first non-alcoholic beer, the first. I guess, a uh, brewery who really invests into this uh, sort of market and really shows that, you know, it really, it's driving the category within Australia, within the world as well, to show that there's, there's actually a lot out, a lot of people out there who appreciate non-alcoholic beer, there's quality that has a story behind it as well. So yeah, the, the brewery itself is not, we don't just brew beer there. We have an absolutely beautiful, Native Foods Cafe. Tell me a little bit about the foods that you do offer at the cafe. Obviously, being in Australia, um, well, we, the, the Native Foods are, are really unique because it's not really offered anywhere. So uh, we off, on our menu, we offer crocodile. Uh, so it's, it's hard to find crocodile in southeast Queensland in particular. You actually got to go to the uh, to Northern Territory or, or yeah, far north Queensland. Uh, to find it. And then you know, we've got some wild boar as well as kangaroo on the menu as well. Um, and those are some of the, I guess, meats, but we do serve, uh, we do use a lot of the herbs and spices as well. So, and fruit. So we do have some lemon myrtle, uh, as well, um, in our foods, uh, as well as finger lime cerveza, uh, and others as well. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. I really want to come and visit. Uh, it's not just the cafe though, right? You've got other things going on there. It's not just the cafe. So we also have a indigenous art gallery actually. So, uh, true to, uh, Clinton and, and who he is in the culture. So he's, he's of, uh, indigenous heritage, uh, and he's really proud of that too. So, uh, he speaks, uh, really proud of who he is and he's actually the president of the Black Dog Institute. Uh, it's a, a wellness institute that uh, supports uh, uh, Australians and Indigenous people uh, through through different aspects. But yeah, he's a president of that, and he is a big ambassador uh, for Indigenous people within uh, Southeast Queensland and Australia. So he really wanted to represent um, Indigenous people art, Indigenous people's art. Um, so yeah, we we've got an up an art gallery upstairs, which uh, gets used for events as well as uh, different things like uh, 
indigenous uh, markets and as well as business meetings. So it's yoga, re- yoga events or retreats, uh, all sorts of different wellness sort of things uh, that can be used upstairs. Yeah. Oh, it sounds beautiful. And we're seeing that as well, like in the branding on the product as well. Yes, correct. So if you look at the branding as well, so we do have uh, a fair bit of branding there. So that represents indigenous people and the art they have. We want to stay true to that. That's at the core, uh, I guess, of who we are. Um, we are moved, We just moved to new packaging, and packaging, but we, I guess we're really trying to remain uh, core to uh, Indigenous art and, and who we are. And your native ingredients as well in the, in the products themselves. So we've got four, well, actually we've got more than four SKUs that have native ingredients. We have about seven, I think, that have native ingredients. Uh, so I'll start off with lemon aspen. So lemon aspen... Uh, is uh, a fruit of uh, southeast Queens, southeast Queensland, n- northern New South Wales is probably where you can find it. Same with finger lime as well, uh, and pepperberry IPA. I've also got some Davidson plum. So a lot of people love Davidson plum. We have an absolutely awesome Davidson plum gluten free ale. Uh, it is very light, um, but uh, really nice, sort of pinky reddish in color, and it's just a beautiful drop to to have. Uh, we've also got things like a aniseed myrtle stout, uh, a wattle seed gold uh, gluten-free ale as well. So yeah, lo- lots to choose from, really making the most of uh, the, the native, I guess, fruits. And yeah, bringing, bringing it to, I guess, bring it to life and letting it shine as well, because we use a lot of other products, you know, in, in the market uses a lot of products in different foods. We want to make Australian native uh, fruits shine in, in our beers. Uh, there's, there's a lot we thinking of doing in the future as well, um, outside of beers and, and highlighting some cool no, no native fruits and things. So yeah, that's, we're looking forward to that. They are honestly stunning. And as somebody yeah. who has tried a lot of non-alcoholic alternatives, yeah. um, they're honestly, they're definitely up there. I think what's also really so special, uh, is the craft beer experience is being able to actually have um, a tasting paddle, being able to really get into each of the different um, beers themselves and really picking up on those notes, those different flavors and those different tastes. And I think, you know, up until kind of five years ago, that's what was missing from the market. I think anyone who's kind of tried a non-alcoholic beer from back then, uh, they've just evolved so much and come such a long way that you can still have that same experience um just without the alcohol and you know they actually taste so much better than some alcoholic beer yep yeah Um, and we talk about what's the point you know (laughs) it's like well why not you know if you can if you can have the exact same experience with like a premium quality product it tastes amazing but you're not having any of the negative side effects of alcohol why (laughs) why not you know Absolutely. You're 100% right. It's funny, like uh, everything you just said is like um, a lot of people experienced at the FHA this week. This week, Like actually I did trick a few people. Um, like a lot of people came over to have a chat to me because they saw the cans at my stand and um, they all thought it was beer. Didn't think it, they didn't think of non-alcoholic beer. So happily do a lot of tasters with people. Um, before realizing, you know, or not even realizing, I think I, I mentioned them, oh, it's non-alcoholic beer. And the, the, the way their face changed as if like they were so surprised that their beer has no alcohol uh, was that, that happened like multiple times, multiple times. So, and even with people, I guess, who came and were, knew it was non-alcoholic and were expecting an inferior taste uh, were shocked as well. So they were like, yes, this is incredible. Um, and I think that's what really drove the, the, the success I had this week with distributors around, around Southeast Asia, Asian market and that. So a lot of uh, distributors were super keen because they, they, there is some non-elks in the market, like you said. Um, but, you know, the, the taste, I think, for some of them uh, is is missing that crafty, really full-flavoured uh the aspect of, of, I guess, having some sort of a fruit in there, potentially the hops. Uh, so we have to really try to highlight that in our beers. I mean, you got to taste it really to, yeah. to experience it, um, to, to really see what it's like, I guess. So, but yeah, it, we're really, we're really happy with where the beers are. 
Um, and we're looking forward to, I guess, experimenting more, I think. And I honestly, I can't wait to come down to the Gold Coast and come and hang out at the brewery because it just sounds like such an epic place to hang out, drink non-alcoholic beers and yeah, soak up some of the culture. So tell me a little bit about what you're seeing in Australia. How is drinking culture, drinking behaviors changing? What are you maybe seeing with different demographics? It's interesting what happened through COVID. Um, the, I guess the experience of people had and uh, the way people were thinking really opened things up, you know? So uh, for the category like non-elk, whether that is uh, wine or spirits or beer, um, really uh, was a forefront of people's mind as an option uh, to consume uh, something different. So uh, I guess in Australia, if you look at that market in particular, the, the Gen Zs, let's call them that, the, you know, the 18 to 24 year olds are really more open to, I guess, alternatives. So much to say that I'll probably say like one to two Gen Zs are, re are, are looking at non-elk options as uh, their preferred option when socializing or if they're looking for something that's, I guess, alternative to alcohol. They are really driving that category. And then on the other end spectrum, there's a lot of, I guess, people health conscious now uh, looking at different ways to, I guess, consume things, whether that, you know, what's written on labels and uh, they, this research being done on alcohol and, and how it affects, you know, different ways of, of living. So there's, there's a lot of research out there, there's a lot of information out there and people are reading, you know, so, and they're getting educated. So there's a fair bit of that happening. And, you know, and that's why we really wanted to offer this, you know, this option out there and really drive the category, not just our brands, but the category and, and lift up that, that, that non-elk space, yeah. It's so interesting that you're talking about Gen Z and to see that in Australia, where Australia have traditionally, especially even with kind of millennials, um, got such a big drinking culture. You know, we grow up and it's the same in the UK where it's like, if you didn't drink, you were yeah. <laughs> alienated almost, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, but I think Gen Z now, I think, you know, with social media and knowing that if you're going to get drunk and make a mess of yourself, mm. that is going to be on, that is going to be public. And I think a lot of Gen Z have kind of seen that behavior in millennials and gone, hell no, I, I don't want to look like that, behave like that, drink like that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's awesome. Absolutely. Like you ask the question, what's the point? And you are, I, would, I would be saying this, who's asking that question? Because it's not, you know, the Gen Zs. They are the future. They are asking the question of what's the point of alcohol. Yeah. So there's a lot of them doing that. So, they, so I mean, the research is showing that, um, you know, alcohol consumption is reducing. Um, whether not just in Gen Zs, but in, you know, older demographic ages as well. So the consumption is dropping a fair bit. So people are being aware, uh, Gen, Z, Gen Zs in particular uh, are the ones, you know, questioning, you know, older demographic ages as well. So whether, why are, they, why are you guys doing it, you know? Why are you guys drinking out or going out or, or, or um, yeah, just drinking in excess, you know? They, and there's a question to be asked as well around... Um, what, what really is not drinking? What really is being sober? What really is being, I guess, being aware? Does it mean you're not drinking alcohol at all? Does it mean you're being aware? Does it mean you're just drinking on certain occasions? There's a whole, there's a whole spectrum there. And, that's his, and, the, and those questions, I guess, we ask is what's bringing down, you know, the consumption. And it's so funny. I just, you spoke about labels then is I'm really trying hard not to label myself sober. Um, and talk about, and I think it's really hard sometimes, especially on social media and, um, and there's a big sober community and everyone's talking about sobriety. Um, I don't drink, like I haven't drank in two years. Um, I, um, I would classify myself as a sober person. Uh, I don't know. And I still kind of am learning as to whether the label sober should be reserved for those people who are in recovery and maybe from an addiction. Like I don't want to take anything away from what they're going through and what they're accomplishing in their sobriety um, because I didn't have the same difficulties um, in terms of not drinking. It was it was never an addiction for me. It was never um, a, a difficult thing giving up the alcohol itself. 
my challenge was um, giving up what I what I thought I was giving up the social connection. Um, I was more worried about losing mm. my friends and family and community uh, by not drinking than than I was about the alcohol. In the past and still happens now, there's a lot of binge drinking. Yeah. So people overdo it on a night out. Uh, they don't even realize what they're doing, what they're consuming. Um, it's the experience out with their friends or whatever the case may be and um, and really sort of intoxicating themselves to points where it's, yeah, and then having silly headaches for days, like, yeah, so it's, it's yeah, it's it's actually quite incredible. <laughs> yeah, then that was me. Yeah. Like, honestly, like, I would rarely, you know, once every three months, I would kind of go out, but... As soon as I hit three drinks, oh, it was three, yep. three to ten. You know, it wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't just. I yeah. couldn't just have three. You know, once I hit that point where I was like, oh yeah, I'll have another and another and yeah. another, and then I was um, pulling the taxi over to be sick on the way home. Yeah. You know, I, in my mid thirties, yeah. <laughs> you know, it gets to a point where you think I have to stop doing this. It's the yeah. definition of insanity. Like, why do I keep putting this into my body and feeling like this? Mm. Um, but coming back to those labels, and yeah. I, I think you know, non-alcoholic alternatives aren't just for people who are sober and uh, they're not just for people like me who've decided not to drink alcohol anymore they're for anybody who just doesn't want to drink for that occasion or in that moment in time i think sometimes putting that pressure on you know i'm living alcohol free or i'm sobriety and putting that label out there there can be so much pressure around that mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you've put all of these rules around your drinking and it's like you know i'm i'm not going to drink anymore and it feels like deprivation it all of a sudden feels hard and difficult yep. and miserable yep. and and that's why a lot of people don't do it when we talk about doing dry january or dry july or sober october where people will have like a month off the booze they go into it thinking this is really hard and I just, I need to stick with it. And this is going to be a really difficult month. And, yeah. you know, they just seem miserable. Yeah. Uh, whereas actually going into it when being a bit more kind of open and not setting so many rules around it and just saying, you know, what, actually maybe I want to drink less and yeah. how I can drink a little bit less is by choosing a non-alcoholic alternative. It's really is putting pressure on people when, when you start, you know, uh, labeling, you know, or, or, or saying the word sober, or people feel like they've got to stick with it. And it's, it's, yeah, it, it puts them under pressure. And that really pulls them away from actually um, trying to, I guess, be the best versions of themselves as well. You know, like I said, people do definitely uh, don't, they don't, don't definitely drink for whatever reason. And we need to, I guess, support those people, whether it's, you know, like I said, they, they just want to go out and have one glass of wine and prefer not to um, overindulge. You know, there's something great in that, I think. You know, you can still experience something without being silly. You know, someone wants to, I guess, just go out to a birthday and have just two beers and have a couple of non-elks in between and drive home. I think those people are the ones we kind of need to go, yay, man, well done. You can, you can label them sober, you can label them not sober, but they're actually putting an effort in. Uh, to not uh, be silly about alcohol, uh, everything within reason, every, as everybody says as well. So, uh, you know, whether you want to be uh, fully non-alc as well, you can do that. There's multiple different ways to, I guess, um, experience uh, a non-alcoholic product. You don't have to be that person that just goes, I'm off alcohol and then put yourself under pressure. And then, you know, as soon as you go back on alcohol, it it turns to who knows what. So. You can you can drink non-alcoholic products yeah. without you know being silly and and being reasonable uh, uh, with a few beverages. I think yeah. I think if we all understand that and understand there's a place for non-alcoholic beer, wine, spirits, whatever that may yeah. be in your life in your social life, the better the better it will be. The the faster you know the consumption of alcohol will drop. The healthier people will be as well. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the best way to think about it um, and, and make sure we're not putting pressure on people to be sober and stone cold sober because um, I don't want to say it's unrealistic, but, you know, everyone's human, you yeah. know. Yeah. And it is. And I've got a bit of a confession to make. And and it's, it's I'm a, a little bit nervous kind of making this, uh, telling this story on here because I don't want a negative reaction from people. Sure. But 
Last week, I was on a boat party in Singapore, friend's birthday, having a great time. I think I was probably the only person on the boat not drinking. Oh, I think there was another pregnant girl. Uh, another pregnant girl. I'm not pregnant. <laughs> Just before my husband <laughs> freaks out. <laughs> um, but no, she was, um, she was pregnant. Uh, and myself, I wasn't drinking. And I bought a bunch of non-alcoholic alternatives. It was a great opportunity for me to try some different uh, beers and sodas and um, yeah. wines and everything. Uh, and then we had a massive thunderstorm while we were on the boat. So we kind of all crammed inside and, um, you know, to kind of pass the time while the storm was going, one of the guys opened a bottle of champagne and kind of went around everybody and just poured like a little bit of champagne in everybody's mouth. And everyone was just in a great mood, singing, dancing. Yeah. And I was just like, I just opened my mouth, had a swig of yeah. champagne and passed it on. Um, I just, I didn't want to break the flow of the party. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be like, oh no, don't, no, don't come near me with that. Like champagne, mm -hmm. it's, you know, I don't drink and make a scene. It was, if it had been tequila or a spirit, it definitely would have been a different story. I yeah. would have been like, absolutely no thanks because yeah. it would have affected me in a completely different way and I don't like them. Uh, but a mouthful of champagne it wasn't a big deal. Yeah. Like I still class myself as sober. I still class myself as a non-drinker. Yeah. I haven't relapsed. It didn't set yeah. me off and make me want to drink the rest of the bottle of champagne. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was fine. It's fine. Yeah. And I think there was going to be a time where that, I would have felt really guilty sure. and I would have gone, oh no, I've broken my sobriety. Why did I do mm. that? And felt really guilty for a mouthful of champagne. Yeah. And that and that's just silly, right? Again, that's kind of the the rules around it yeah. and um setting yourself too many rules. You know, I drank non-alcoholic drinks the sure. whole day and felt great, had a great time. Next morning, woke up, was able to take care of my kids on Sunday, not yeah. feeling rough. Yeah. Um so yeah, it's exactly what you're saying around the labeling and pressure. Thanks for sharing that because yeah, it's but it shows you like a lot of people, you know, feel that they are is this, they are pressured to actually do the right thing, feel like they need to, if they're going to not drink alcohol, stick to it, and put yeah. pressure on themselves and unnecessary. And yeah, it's, you know, I don't, it's, it's very, you know, like I understand that there are people out there struggling, right? I don't want to uh, say that it's okay as well. There's a lot of people out there struggling and let's make that pretty clear. Look, you know, there are alternatives for them, whether they want it or not, but um, for, I guess, people who are not in that space of struggling and just want to drink or consume less, you can definitely do that. And there are alternatives out there. There's some great alternatives. You know, find them and, you know, share them and help other people as well consume less because, yeah, we definitely we need to continue dropping the, the alcohol consumption. Yeah, for sure. And that's it. Is I've said this a hundred times is non-alcoholic alternatives have just come such a long way and they were the game changer for me uh they just allowed me to be able to connect continue to connect with my friends and family i didn't miss out on anything i was able to feel included and enjoy yeah. my time and so my you know whatever event that we were at so yeah. it it they are it's Honestly, they're a game changer. This is why I'm talking about them, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I think I think the next the next thing that I guess you look at is, you know, like cigarettes. You know, in a lot of countries they get banned. You know, they they don't uh, market and and really sort of put a social aspect uh, to a social event, so it feels like you have to do it. I think you know, like like, like cigarettes have you know, been pulled away in a lot of markets. I think alcohol is going to be eventually. It's going to. It's going to happen at, at some point. It's moving that way. It might take a long time. Might be quicker than we think. Um, but yeah, I think alcohol will be then deassociated from social events, which will be a great thing eventually because then that's what really you know um, sparks people to move towards an alcoholic beverage is the huge amounts of money getting pumped into marketing. Yeah for, you know, whatever product, you know, because they just got silly money that they're playing with and they can do it and it's acceptable. So um, till that, I guess, changes as well. Uh, that's a big, a big thing that needs to, I guess, happen eventually. That's going to help everything as well. I get quite emotional when I hear about um, alcohol brands buying uh, non-alcoholic <laughs> brands. Big alcohol is responsible for a lot of negative things. I'll just oh. put it that way. 
I know that they want to corner kind of the alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks market, um, but it's still, they still do want to keep people drinking alcohol. No doubt. Look, without mentioning any names, I think it's clear that, you know, they can see there's a shift. Uh, it might start, you know, the shift might be slow right now, but, um, you know, this is what the big brands do. They, they back themselves and they make sure they're covered in all aspects in terms of innovation. So if they don't have a big brand that's, I guess, moving towards that, they'll buy one um, or create one themselves and flood the market uh, so they can, yeah, just absolutely swallow up the market share and look like also they're doing something good. But really yeah. uh, where a lot of their money is being made is still with the alcohol products. They'll still market, you know, zero, zero, zero for certain products. Um, yet, you know, some of that product I know firsthand is even given out for free some of the zero products, which is great. And I guess, and they're helping in the zero category, but at the same time, you know, they, uh, you got to question, I guess, what is their, their, I guess, mission there and motive. what, what, is, what is yeah. their motive? Because, um, they know where they make money, yeah. you know, so. We've, yeah. we've spoken about this, um, before on this podcast, um, about global beer brands giving their zero uh, percent beer yeah. to free away for free, and it yeah. it makes it really hard actually for for brands like yourself to yeah. get into bars and restaurants because bars and restaurants will say, well, actually I've already got my mm -hmm. non alcoholic beer and I don't pay for it, so it's one hundred percent markup, um, and and that's it. I don't need another one, um, and. Honestly, okay, the products are fine, but they're not the best in market. And actually, you've got brands like Sober that are so beautiful, such quality product, and people are missing out on them because they're um, maybe a lot of restaurants and bars aren't open to having kind of a full range. Without bagging some of these big companies too much, um, I think, you know, what they're doing uh, for the likes of, uh, you know, us, you know, being dedicated to non alcoholic. Uh, beer is it's, it's hard obviously we, we got to work through that you know ourselves and really drive um, our own unique points to the market uh, it is a challenge definitely but you know I think the story with us needs to be told uh, we, we've really got to sell who we are what we do why we do it um, as well um, so people can actually um, see the depth within us without just I guess picking up an on elk so yeah, it is definitely poses a huge challenge um, yeah. for us as a business to grow because yeah, for us it's not just about you know being profitable. We we operate as a social enterprise as well. So we're not out there you know um, with you know trying to sell and have we don't publicly list it in other words or, or anything like that. We actually do a lot of good as well. So. Uh, that's really important to us. It's at the core of who we are as well. So it's hold that thought because yeah. I want to come back to this because um, this is so important. Um, the the social enterprise part of your business. Uh, but before we do, I just want to kind of wrap up the conversation around the restaurants and bars yep. because um, if anyone owning a restaurant or bar mm -hmm. is listening to this, yes, uh, you know, five ten years ago, you didn't have vegetarian menus or vegan options there might have been one or two on the menu but now you're seeing you almost have a separate menu for vegetarians and vegans and this week at pro wine there have been lots of conversations about money being left on the table mm -hmm. uh you know is if i go out with my husband he drinks alcohol i don't if there are no non-alcoholic options, like I don't drink sodas mm. and fizzy drinks and things that are really super sweet. Sure. I don't, occasionally I'll have a mocktail, but again, I don't necessarily want something that's loaded with sugar. Sure. If there is not a non-alcoholic option on the menu, I am ordering water. And you potentially, as a restaurant or bar, missed out on 20, 30, even 40 bucks yeah. um, of uh, two, three, however many drinks I would have drank. Yeah. Um, so there's money being left on the table by you not having a non-alcoholic option um, or a selection, even better, a selection of non-alcoholic options. You are absolutely right in this space because I think if you're a cafe, restaurant, bar, hotel, uh, events, if you run events or if you run, I don't know what, you know, that requires beverages, 
you seriously need to think about the non-elk uh, beverage space, like beer, wine, spirits, as you know, the same the way you treat the beer or anything else. You want quality brands. Yeah. You know, you want you want to have that. Um, so if you are in any of those spaces, please think about. It. I would say to cafes, bars, restaurants, and everything else, just think about uh, what products you're stocking in your fridges, uh, wherever that may be, or what products you're serving, because um, you want a premium product as well. People are looking for premium products. Yeah. There are lots out there, so you just got to look for them. Uh, we obviously are in that space. We we continually look for, I guess, uh, options uh, of different categories we can get ranged in. Uh, that includes supermarkets as well as you know uh, liquor and bottle shops and stuff. So we want to be the options. You want to you want to be on the menu because there's people out there looking for the options. They walking into store. They're walking into restaurants, bars. They also want a good experience. Um, they, 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 there's, there's quite a few of them out there. And like we said, the Gen Z's out there, they want to have a good experience. So, uh, make sure you have something on your menu, something on the shelf, something in your fridges that can provide them that experience. Yeah. It's smaller market than, than the big, than the bigger other categories. However, it's still people who want to, I guess, you know, be there and experience your venue or whatever your bottle shop or whatever that may be. So I would say to them, yeah, look into it and definitely, just, yeah. Just be inclusive, you know, um, like you would be if somebody is vegan or vegetarian. Correct. I think the other thing is people are looking for less sugar as well. So, you know, people are drinking less and people are looking for products sure. with less sugar and don't always want a stevia or an artificial sweetener, a Diet Coke or something something different. Sure. Um, and a lot of the non-alcoholic alternatives also are really, really low in sugar. So Absolutely. just overall, they're, they're better for you. Yeah, no, they definitely are. Um, you know, with our beers, you know, the brewing process is so people know as well as, because um, a lot of people wonder about this. The brewing process is no different to, um, I guess, uh, usual brewing process. The only difference is as well, we uh, use a, a different yeast that uh, is, it, it, we can control the fermentation process basically. Uh, so it doesn't ferment into large amounts of alcohol. Ours is absolutely minute, it's yeah. considered non-alcoholic. Um, and in that same process, yeah, the, the sugars obviously is a lot less uh, uh, in that space. So yeah, a lot less sugar. Uh, we don't add, in, add any pre um, preservatives, chemicals or anything like that. It's completely natural, water, yeast, um, malts, you know, grains, hops, pretty simple. So coming back to Gen Z, um, not only are they looking for non-alcoholic brands and products, um, they're also looking for brands that are doing some good and that have some meaning behind them. Oh. So yeah, I know you touched earlier a little bit on kind of social enterprise and sustainability, but please tell us more about this because to me, this is magic. Yeah, so, you know, I'll start with, I guess, trying to be sustainable as much as we can. Running a brewery um, is, yeah, the energy you use and the water you use is astronomical, the amount of energy and water you use, uh, no matter what brewery it is. So we try our best to make sure we are sustainable as possible. Uh, for example, like we, we, we are solar panelled, panelled all on the roofs, make sure we, we, we're pulling energy, obviously, from that heat source. Um, ensuring we have, uh, we've got gas as well. So we run off gas because we run a pasteurizer. So if you are non-alcoholic uh, beer, you pretty much have to pasteurize most of the time. Otherwise, yeah, you'll get second fermentation. We pasteurize, so use a lot of water pasteurizing. You use a lot of water brewing beer as well. So uh, uh, we collect water on our, on our roofs and we've got two massive tanks underground, water tanks that we collect water. Uh, it's uh, obviously filtered through, uh, which we use for our beer, we use for our pasteurizer as well. Uh, so those are just a few processes that we kind of use to ensure that we use the least amount of energy drawn from anywhere. Uh, make sure it's natural sources, um, ensuring yeah, the water as well. It's yeah, we, we recollect our water as well and it goes back through the filtration process and gets reused. So I think it's really important and there's things like um, Obviously, the, the the grains and stuff that we use uh, once you first in the in the brewing process, you know, all all our mash. Uh, once we get once we mash in, you know, we got all this beautiful mash that gets left over. Uh, so what we do is we collect all that uh, and we um, get we we have some local farmers that we give that to, 
and they uh, really appreciate it because it's really fantastic nutrients for their cows. Okay, great. Uh, so it's it's some of the best sort of nutrients they can sort of feed their cows as well. So we give that back, and that gets obviously consumed by the cows. So it's it's a full on process that we try to make sure we we live up to and we act as sustainable as possible. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, there's. There's, there's a lot of different ways to do things and we want, we're trying to do it the best way possible. And it's so important, um, so important, I think. But particularly for Gen Z, they really care. Um, I think they're more educated, right, um, yes. than maybe yeah. the other generations on this. Yeah. So yeah. that's awesome. And then social enterprise. Yes, so. social enterprise. Look, we are super connected to the community uh, in the Gold Coast. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we located in Billy Head, so we're super connected there. Uh, and, you know, we, we make sure we give him back. So one good example of that is we connected with the Preston Campbell Foundation. If you don't know Preston Campbell, he is a former rugby league player, so very well known here in the Gold Coast and around Australia. He's pretty much an icon to a lot of people. And he's an Indigenous man, First Nations man as well. So, uh, he, uh, so he's got a foundation that he has that supports uh, First Nations people um, in, I guess, teaching them um, how to... I, I guess, uh, follow their dreams and get mentored in that space uh, on how to, I guess, pick up their dreams, how to, I guess, move on and apply that in life, apply that in, you know, trying to find work in, works, in the workspace um, and ensuring that they integrate really well. So uh, we support, that's just one of the founders, we have multiple other ones that we support. Uh, things like, you know, uh, wellness is big as well for us. Um, every month we, we, we're holding wellness events upstairs in our in our gallery, um, so uh, we hold things like yoga uh, classes, uh, cacao um, experiences as well. Oh, as you've got me sold. I'm. <laughs> I, I think I might just plan a trip just to come and see you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, sound sound immersions or sound oh, yeah. healing events as well. So, really tapping into uh, that space of wellness and ensuring that people are looking after themselves um, and giving them a space where they can experience something as well as in as a brewery and everything else but uh, giving them a space to do that um, a lot of the times you know some of the things we put on as free events as well uh, to you know because you got to recognize it's I think you know where everything is in the world right now it's tough for a lot of people so um, you know when people want to look after themselves it's it can be challenging because things can get expensive when it comes to wellness yeah. itself. So it puts people off. So I want to ensure we we provide that um, and, you know, that, that experience where people can just come in and not worry about, you know, paying for a huge amount of uh, – a, a big amount to come into a class or anything. So we provide some of those uh, those Beautiful. experiences free at that time. So. so much more than just an alcohol-free beer. And I don't even want to say just an alcohol-free beer because you're one of the best um, and it's such a beautiful, interesting, tasty, incredible product. Um, but everything that you're doing around it just makes it that bit more special. And I, I love this and I love talking to you. I've loved talking to you the last four days um, awesome. at the event. I kept um, coming to visit your stand because um, I'm just, yeah, so fascinated by the brand and the story and yourself. So really, thank you so much for coming to see me. Thanks, Michelle. Um, now, I always ask my guests this last question. Uh, who should I talk to in the industry? Um, if I should invite someone on the podcast, um, who should I talk to? Who do you think's doing interesting stuff? It could be another drinks brand. It could be someone who's building a community, someone who is just telling great stories. That's a great question, Michelle. In terms of who would be a great person to, I guess, bring on here? I definitely, I'd probably say a founder Clinton. Yeah. Um, he, he's, he's an incredible person. Um, he's a doctor in psychology. Uh, he works uh, in, in, in a beautiful space of helping people um, in the, at the Black Dog Institute. Um, so he's, uh, yeah, he's got a lot of stories to tell. He's accomplished incredible things. Yeah. Uh, will not tell you anything just yet because in case you do want to interview him, he's, uh, he's a man of many talents and a lot of people look up to him uh, within the communities in, in, in the Gold Coast and Australia of, for all the good he's doing for the Indigenous and First Nations people. So I would definitely uh, yeah, 
see him as an awesome person to talk to. But like I said, there's so many good people doing awesome things in the world. Um, there's not just, you know, one or two. It's, it's really about, you know, ensuring you highlight and think about who, who's out there. Thank you so much for your time, Leo. It's been so nice talking to you. Um, I've really, really enjoyed it and I feel like I could keep this conversation going forever. Um, But really, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you for having me on, Michelle.